Good morning, everyone. After a nice talk of Vincent, we have another really nice talk. Uh, it's about transfer learning with uh, Booster Trees. Um, next to me, we have Busha uh, Chikla and Paul uh, Shetowski. And please, please give them a super warm welcome. Here you are, and enjoy. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our presentation on transfer learning with gradient boosted trees. Um, who are we? We were just introduced, but just some more information. We are two data scientists from ING, who are working in Amsterdam. Um, my colleague is Busha Zikla. She has been a data scientist with ING for about five years. She has an academic background in data science. My name is Paul. I'm a data scientist with ING for two years, and I have a PhD in machine learning and psychiatry. You can think for yourself who made the more logical career trajectory. <laughs> We are part of the retail banking analytics tribe of ING Analytics, and the tribe's focus is on analytics products in lending, pricing, collection, and personalization. Now, if all of these words don't mean too much to you, we hope that at least one of them will meet, mean something more to you in a couple of slides. And that word is lending. So what ING offers to their customers is an instant lending profi uh, process. What that means is that if you're a customer of ING, that means you have at least one current account with ING, and you need a loan for a purchase, I think nowadays this could be a grocery bill, you can just go to the ING website and fill out an application immediately, which requires some ID verification, specification of loan amounts and, uh, and terms. And now comes the important part. If you give ING consent to use your ING transactional data, so the historical data ING has on you, then you can end, uh, enter the um, instant lending flow. What does that mean? It basically composes out of two main uh, checks. One check is affordability. That means based on your transactional data, we will uh, instantly estimate your incomes and expenses, and we will try to understand what is the maximum loan amount you are able to pay back. Another part of the puzzle is creditworthiness, also called acceptance, where we use machine learning models real time on uh, transactional data to try to predict whether this customer who applied for the loan uh, is likely to default within a period of one year. What does default mean? Essentially, if he or she is able to pay back the loan or not. It's a binary classification problem. There are, of course, also other checks. The talk here will be focused on credit horses. If all of these boxes you know, return green, then we can disperse the loan immediately to the, to the applicant. If one of the boxes doesn't approve what the customer asked for, then we will reject the application. Why would we want to do that? I think it's fairly straightforward. It has all kinds of uh, benefits for customers. Basically, it's a very convenient and easy process. You don't have to upload all kinds of documents, etc. You get a fast response, may I say instant. And for ING, it has also, of course, uh, advantages. Namely, it's a high degree of automation, meaning that no one needs to check manually documents, etc. This process just runs. And by using machine learning models in the creditworthiness and acceptance process, we can estimate your probability of defaulting, of not paying back the loan, fairly accurately, which reduces the risk of, uh, uh, which ING has when dispersing a loan and makes uh, less losses for ING. Okay, that's all good, but what does that have to do with transfer learning? Well, I just told you, this process is already in place with, uh, for customers which are already with ING, so-called known-to-bank customers. We have a big database of customers which already applied for loans. We have a lot of transactional data, a lot of transactional history for these customers. And we could build a nice gradient boosted model like GBM to predict their risk, so to predict their default, basically. It performs well. However, believe it or not, not everyone is a customer of ING. Actually, there are two other customer segments uh, available. There are so-called fresh-to-bank customers, which have an account with ING, but the history, the transaction history, is much lower than for the known-to-bank customers. They also show, in historical loan applications, in a non-instant process, uh, different characteristics on, in terms of default rate and defaulting patterns. So the immediate question would be, okay, can we enable this instant lending flow for these fresh-to-bank customers uh, as well? The even bigger uh, um, sort of uh, thing which we would like to achieve in the future is to open this funnel to so-called new-to-bank customers. Those customers, by its name, don't have transactional data with ING at all, but given a specific EU directive, if they want, they can share their um, transactions from a different EU bank with ING such that they would also enter this flow. 
but we have no data on these customers available at ING, meaning we cannot train our models on that. So for us, the question and the question of transfer learning would be, how can we model on fresh to bank customers and can we use knowledge we have on our known to bank customers to imp uh, improve that process? Okay, before going into any sort of uh, modeling results, we need to set up our machine learning flow just to know what we're talking about. How does it work? It's fairly straightforward. We take all historical in-scope data we can have, that includes transactional data and features derived from it. This includes application info information and includes specifically defaulting information. So it's all historical from loan applications we already have, basically, at ING. This data set is then split across time, essentially to create a training and a test set data set. The training set is for us is called an in-time data set, and all the good machine learning stuff is done on this, feature selection, hyperparameter tuning, comparison of different experiments using cross-validation, and final model training, and for us, again, it's an LGBM classifier. The out-of-time data set composes the most recent six months of data we have available, and we estimate our final performance of the model using uh, area under the receiver operator curve. Importantly, again, just to, to bring this point across, we want to apply and open the instant lending uh, funnel for the fresh-to-bank customers. So all the final performance estimates also, which we will be showing in the presentation, are on those customers. Good. So what would be the simplest thing you can do? The simplest thing would be not to do any transfer learning, but just stra stra straight-up machine learning. I just told you that we do have some data of the fresh to bank customers. They don't have so much transactional history, and we have not so many applications because they are not coming from an instant funnel. But we do have some data. So the easiest thing to do would be just to train a model on those customers alone. This is, can be considered as our baseline model. And what we uh, observed when we did this is the performance was actually fairly decent, more than what we expected initially. However, it had came with a downside that this is a very small data set, and it was a bit unstable over time. So the question became, can we do something better? What would be the next step? Well, still no transfer learning, but at least some transfer. What would happen if we just use the known to bank customer segment? We take only um, a limited history of transactions, matching the one we have for the fresh to bank customers, and we train a model on that. What you can see here is that we do observe an improvement in AOC in comparison to the uh, baseline model. This improvement is not high, but it is there. We have a larger training data set, the model performance is more stable, and it's a very simple to explain model, right? You just train on one data set, apply to another one. The next logical step here would be just to combine everything together. We have data from fresh to bank, we have data from known to bank, how about we just combine them, train on both. We still saw an uplift in comparison to the baseline model, but no uplift in comparison to the model two. What we uh, suspected there is that the fresh to bank data set is just large enough to mess up the pattern for the, uh, which we learned from the known to banks, but not large enough to actually contribute something, at least not in this very simple way. Okay. Now, some of you might be, if they're still awake, thinking, okay, the topic of the talk was transfer learning with gradient boosting. I heard a bit of transfer, I heard a bit of uh, learning, I heard a bit about something called instant bending or whatever the guy was saying, <laughs> but no transfer learning. The good news here is that this is the time to wake up, to pay attention, because Bushra is going to be taking you exactly through that. Thank you, Paul, for uh, waking up the audience for the rest <laughs> of the presentation. Uh, let's move to transfer learning part, proper transfer learning. So what you heard from Paul, that we started with uh, simple experiments, where we technically transfer some knowledge from node to bank to fresh to bank. But actually, this is uh, not all you can do, right? So this is not a proper way of doing uh, transfer learning. So what would be the proper way is actually this. So you would start with modeling on node to bank customer. You would keep this model as it is. And then you would put some adjustment on top to make it better performing uh, on fresh to bank customer. Uh, so after uh, completing this uh, simple experiment and learning some things from uh, these uh, fresh to bank and no to bank customers, we move to these experiments uh, by following this logic. Uh, this logic is very commonly used in uh, deep learning models like neural networks, right? So you can find, uh, for example, language model uh, pre-trained already, and then you can uh, put additional layer at the end and fine tune on your data, and this will make uh, the pre-trained model better performing uh, for your purpose. So 
obviously we are working in a credit risk domain and it is regulative, so using deep learning is a bit uh, too strong statement in, in our field. So we try to find a way to implement the same logic with uh, the gradient boosted uh, trees. So the question for us, uh, is it possible to do this kind of approaches by using uh, boosting uh, trees? And for us, uh, we uh, like to use light GBM, so we uh, follow that direction. And luckily, the answer is yes here. Otherwise, I think we wouldn't be uh, here uh, to share our knowledge from transfer learning experiments. And we figured out two main approaches. One is refitting approach, another one is adding trees. And now I will uh, explain both approaches to you and show the results at the end. And uh, we will uh, comment uh, together uh, on the results. Let's start with refitting approach. Um, just to give the general idea of refitting, I would like to make the problem we are try trying to solve uh, a bit simpler. And also, instead of thinking about light GBM, let's think about the uh, decision tree, which is a unit uh, component of light GBM uh, algorithms. And let's say this is our non to bank customer. We have 17 um, uh, video gamers out of 25 customers, and our aim is to predict uh, if the customers like video games or not with a simple decision tree. Um, if you fit a decision tree on this uh, population, it would look like this, maybe. So you would get two splits. Uh, one is about age, another one is about if the customers are using computer daily basis. So what you did right now, you uh, split the main population into some more homogeneous end leaves. And based on these end leaves, now you will uh, make a prediction about your new customers, for example, right? So if you check the end leaf one, the uh, probability of having video gamer now is 33%. OK, now you fit the model uh, on an out bank customer. So this is the first step of a proper way of doing transfer learning, right? So what is the second step? It is adjusting this model. So in refitting, the adjustment is done uh, only on the end leaves. So you're having the new data set, which is your interest. In our case, it is fresh to bank. And you're keeping the pattern you learn from known to bank models, which are these splits about age and using computer daily basis. And then you're checking the distribution within each end leaf by checking your uh, fresh to bank customers. And if we continue the uh, same end leaf, end leaf one, uh, you see the probability of uh, having a video gamer in this group is now 25%. So you change uh, the output from the end leaves with this way. Um, something to mention here, here you assume that the patterns you see in no to bank customer is completely the same with fresh to bank customer, right? So you don't change the uh, patterns uh, available there between features and the target. The uh, only thing you are doing is uh, you are adjusting the end leaves to uh, maybe show the target uh, base characteristic differences in fresh to bank customers. And this was the decision tree example, but we are not using decision tree and we are not trying to solve this simple problem in our credit risk domain. And if you go back to the reality in light GBM model, it would look like this. So light GBM. Uh, models have sequential trees where each tree tries to fix the, fix the errors made in the previous trees, right? So if you check the uh, orange uh, part, so this is the first model you are fitting on known to bank customer, and then you are freezing the patterns, the tree structure you figured out in this part, and you are only changing the distribution of end leaves in the second step with fresh to bank customers. And how this would look like in the notebook, in your code base, uh, it would look like only two lines of code, and that's it. So you would first fit uh, your light GBM classifier by using a simple fit function on top of uh, known to bank uh, customer data. And now you completed the first step. And second step, calling the booster attributes from this classifier class, because this booster has the tree structure you already figured out from known to bank customer. And then there is a refit function here. And in a refit, you are providing the new data set you would like to uh, focus on, which is fresh to bank. And there's also one more parameter you see, right? Decay rate. So what is this decay rate? So it is actually a flexibility like GBM gives to you. Uh, it, it acts like sample when you are calculating output from each end leaf. So you have freedom to say that I would like to refit on fresh to bank customer, but I still would like to keep some uh, information from no to bank and leaves. Then you can set up the decay rate uh, bigger than zero. So this will also give some weights 
uh, to know the bank customer when you are getting output from n -lips. So if you see the plots, so y-axis is before repeating and x-axis is after repeating. And if you set the decay rate zero, it means that you're just using fresh to bank customers uh, uh, distribution at the end leaves. And it will uh, make the probability differences bigger. But if you go with the default rate, the change will be very minor. And in our case, we follow decay rate zero because we wanted to focus on fresh to bank customers specifically. So this was the first approach, and as I said, this assumes that patterns are same in uh, two data sets. But in reality, probably it is not the case, right? Probably there are some new patterns, there are patterns that conflict with the first patterns you figured out. Is there a way to adjust the pattern you learn from the first model for the uh, second group? And the answer is again yes, so there's a second approach, uh, and it works as adding nodes or trees, and if we uh, continue the decision tree example. Uh, it would look like this. You would start with two splits you figured out from node to bank customer, uh, which are eight and using computer daily. But you wouldn't stop here. You would investigate further, only checking fresh to bank customer. And you would get two more splits, having kids or having PlayStation. See, you uh, figured out more now about your fresh to bank customer. And this will give you to do some corrections um, uh, if, if you uh, have a pattern which doesn't fit for fresh to bank customer, this is the moment for you to fix by adding new nodes. Uh, and if you go back to light GBM example, so you again fit first three, and then you are adding more trees uh, sequentially on top of this first tree, and these new trees are coming from fresh to bank customers. Uh, and you see there's no freezing uh, split or anything. This is all uh, sequential trees at the end. You're combining to come up with the final model, which works better for fresh to bank customer. And if you check the code base, again, it looks just two lines of code. Uh, so you are first fitting the norm to bank model. And then in the second model, you are giving this first model as the initial model. So you say uh, second light GBM. Please start uh, where I stop in the first model and continue uh, learning more on this new data set. So this sounds very simple to apply, but if you think deeper, it's very hard to optimize. It's very hard to find the uh, features uh, which, are uh, which would work best, and also the parameters would work best for this concept. Um, the important part, in our opinion, is about how many trees to add in the second part. Because first part, yes, you learn the known to bank customer, you get these patterns. But in second part, you have to figure out how much correction needed, how many trees I should add. So if you add, for example, uh, only one tree, new tree from fresh to bank, on top of 100 trees you learn from known to bank customer, this would, wouldn't make any impact. So it would be simply the same model uh, with the initial uh, one. Or, Let's think the extreme other case. So you had only uh, one tree from non to bank customer and added 100 tree from fresh to bank customer. Then you make only, you know, a standalone fresh to bank model. So there is there must be an optimized uh, uh, number of trees you should choose. And what we did here, we first focus on the first model and we fine tune that one. We found optimal features and we found optimal uh, parameters. And then we kept this as uh, um, as uh, stable. So we didn't change the first part anymore, and we only tuned the second part. So with this way, we got a result. And now I will show you the results, and I will explain uh, which one we chose at the end. So here you see the simple approaches Paul explained, and uh, you already know the performance improvements. And uh, these are the results from transfer learning. Uh, with refitting, we increased the AUC a little bit more than the simple approaches. Uh, with the transfer learning, uh, we couldn't uh, achieve so big improvements, unfortunately. Um, uh, and if you check the complexity between these um, uh, approaches, uh, going with the transfer learning actually uh, creates lots of extra work on us. Uh, we are working in risk domain and we have very solid uh, validation structure at ING. So every time when you change something in the modeling, uh, you have to explain everything to them and you have to make sure that it is acceptable from their side and also business side. So thinking of these extra work and uh, also checking the AUCs, we decided to go with only uh, using the model on not a bank customer. But uh, as Paul mentioned, there was a big 
uh, characteristic difference we saw on fresh to bank customer about default rates. It is higher than non to bank customer, and to deal with this, we just calibrated this model. Uh, we were using fresh to bank customer, at least this uh, brought the mean uh, predictions uh, to the correct observed default rate in fresh to bank customer. Okay, so what is the uh, key takeaway from this talk for you? Uh, do, do we mean all of this uh, transfer learning stuff is not worth your time? Uh, of course, the answer is not true. Uh, for us, it didn't uh, give uh, dream uh, results for us on our use case, but it really depends on the use case, right? So if your data set, data size is uh, so small to do this transfer learning, you will not make it. Or if the characteristics of these two different data sets are not suitable for this approach, again, you won't get uh, benefits you expected. So what I suggest you just go and uh, if you have a use case where you are dealing with a similar problem, just go and try. And uh, I think it's worth to uh, try, give it a try, this kind of approach in boost trees. And for us, it is not the end of the journey, actually. We are planning to investigate this kind of approaches further for different use cases. For example, retraining. Uh, we are thinking to update your model in the production. You don't have to wait a very long time to collect this data. What you can do, just collect a little bit of data and just check you know, if refitting is helping uh, to improve this model you are using in production. This could be a simple idea to use. So in the future, we will figure out. And last point, uh, our team works with different countries, so we are in global level of ING. And we are thinking maybe we can tailor already existing models for different uh, countries and different portfolios. Uh, by using two approaches we uh, work on from proper transfer learning side. So that's all uh, from us today. Uh, if you have any questions, we are happy to answer right now.